You're listening to the Russell Brand Podcast in demand and on demand. Hello, I'm Russell. If you want to talk to me and Matt, you can email us at russellandmatt at audioboom.com. We're here, of course, with Mr. G, who's the poet of the show, who will summarise this nonsense at the end of it as if to make some sort of sense of it, to make some sort of narrative out of what is essentially just a tunnel of nonsense. Joe, listening to the Russell Brand Podcast with Russell and Matt. Oh, yeah. Don't look at this as a nostalgic project. Look at no, this look, as a forward-thinking to... podcast. Right, future. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I <laughs> promised myself I wouldn't cry. You can't cry. even say bright future. <laughs> without... Do you know what I feel like? It's only because moved... the only food to eat around your house is nuts. So I've got bits of nuts We're in my throat. We're trying to make a podcast and you sound... So wretched, <laughs> <laughs> and elderly. Right, I was thinking, future. we 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 before we came out. I wanted to not mention the topics we're talking about, about like the various ways now that we feel old. You're a father. G's married, but look at me. Woo! I'm divorced. I'm a divorcee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of joining a dating website. Like this is meant. This is we're embracing the techno future. We're on a podcast now, Matthew. Yeah, I know. I'm doing my best. I just had a, a little cough. Have you changed much then? Um, no, still the same. Yeah. I think that the tragedy of life, or the good thing of life, is no one ever changes. I feel exactly the same as I do when you were did a little boy when I was fifteen. I mean, eat right down to using the present tense to so, describe yeah. that state. <laughs> I feel the same as I am now. I'm fifteen. I feel the same as I do when I'm two. I feel the same <laughs> as I do when I'm twenty-two. Do you have you changed since we last broadcast? Have I? Woo! Changes. I'm only one of the most important people in the world. Did you not see the other day that I'm one of the world's best brains or something? Yeah, I did see that. I can't what believe I'm one you? of the world's best What thinkers. number are you? It's, I think I'm soaring up the charts. I think I'm straight in at number three or something. I'm like wet, wet, no. wet. No. Isn't it 50 greatest minds in the world or something? Of the greatest minds in the world, right. I'm certainly Find one of them. Find out what number he is. Look at the other ones. They're all proper people. Can like, you go up next year? What do you mean? Like I could go up like the Like you ranks. could have a really good idea and <laughs> go at number two. Guys, wait till you see this new water filter I've developed. I'll be gold. Oh, he's done something naughty. Oh dear. <laughs> Off the list. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I when I read, I read a story about it, obviously, and in it it said uh, right because like you know previous winners Richard Dawkins, Mao Zedong. Hang on, are you a winner of it? Well, I yeah, no, I'm not a winner. I'm oh. just in contention. But like right. obviously, it's outraged certain sectors of the press. Squares. The squares, mate, they don't like to see me with my estuary vows and my tight little bowels <laughs> shooting up the thinking charts. They'd like it to be some old fuddy-duddy. So like in the, in the Evening Standard, it said, Russell Brand's been plaguing Prospect magazine with phone calls demanding to be on that list. What? I haven't. How did like, they find that out? Three or four calls at <laughs> most. <laughs> I tell you, I'm bloody much the car. It's the white brand. Obviously, you didn't do that. Well, I didn't even know what Press Prospect magazine was yeah. until I found out that they've respected these thoughts I've been having. And then you thought, that's the bloody best magazine in this country. The press will do anything to disparage me. After one of my bouts of quite worthwhile uh, talking or thinking, and I don't know what it is I get <laughs> rewarded for these days, I'm sure I've got Thinking prizes. before talking, generally. I, 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 I do a bit of thinking, then I'll do some talking. Sometimes I, I just go purely with impulse. But one night I came back here, there was a... like. I was in the middle of some sort of scandal. I was on the front page of the Sun or something, and and uh, there was a Daily Mail journalist outside the house. He couldn't have looked more like a, a Daily Mail journalist. He was sort of wearing he was wearing a Mac. He he looked like he'd been blended at the he last. He was wearing minute. a Mac. Yeah, you have a little hat on with a like press, press pass in it. Pass yeah, in the rim. He might as well have a yeah, grubby sort of quite, pad. He was a bit. Uh, he was quite auburn with ringletty hair. Poor scene. Like at the last right. minute, in the, like I said, the last month of gestation, he'd been in a sow. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd been born part pig. He had right. a sort of a piglet quality to him. And then, like, and then he went, uh, Russell, I'm here from the Daily Mail. Uh, have you got any quotes on something or another about a landlord rent or some abstract thing? And I'd just been around a really, really poor person's house making the most righteous film imaginable with a man called Michael Winterbottom, whose name you're going to accept in a mature manner. And I've heard of Michael Winterbottom. Have you? Yeah, Old chilli bum. <laughs> <laughs> of course I've heard of him. Frosty bot. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, like, I've been around this woman's house, and like, and like, they were really poor, and we were talking about like, you know, austerity and all this stuff. This film I'm doing with Michael Winterbottom. I mentioned I was hungry at the house, and the woman goes, "Oh, we got to have some soup. We're in Basildon, in Essex. Oh, we got to have some soup." And I was like, "Oh." No, you're all right. I didn't. What I thought. I can't come around here. Show business person. And how did you mention it though? I don't know why I mentioned that I was hungry. I was sat there in their house in the front room talking about they couldn't afford the university's degree. What, what, what did I actually say? Yeah, no, I'm wondering if you sort What's of like, we can't afford this. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, my daughter can't go to university. You got any Jaffa cakes, love? <laughs> come on, hand it over. I what time like you have chicken tonight? dinner in this? Ditch. <laughs> What's that smell? It better be. It better not be what I'm eating. I'm famished. Anyway, these people, God love them. The mums goes, yeah, like goes. I'm hungry. I bellowed it. I must have. I don't know. I remember. I thought I was being. You are. You probably, probably be going. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just a bit hungry or something for something else. Yeah. And then she as latched soon onto as it. I said it. I knew they had the vibe of a nan, the mum and the daughter, and that yeah. I shouldn't have said it. That they would have to react. I'm hungry. They went. Oh, we'll have to eat. I got some butternut scotch soup in the butternut scotch <laughs> soup. <laughs> she just she named it out right. Butternut squash soup. She said. I got some butternut squash soup. Do you want it? And it was in a bag. It was a bag of soup. I guess they'd made it earlier and bagged it up. It was in the kind of bag. Say you got a pint of blood off someone. Like yeah. I don't know you're in. Now that's how soup comes these days. He didn't have any Matthew. Didn't I know have... what soup is. It didn't have labels on it. It wasn't branded. It was see-through. It was like, it was as, you know, when someone's walking around a, drip, a hospital. Yeah. It was like a drip bag. A fluid drip. See-through and everything. Yeah. So she gave me that. It's she probably goes, a colostomy bag. Whose house was this? <laughs> 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 she handed me a colostomy bag full of butternut squash soup. She goes, and I said, oh, thank you. I'll have that when I get home. So I arrived home. It was dark. I'm tired. I'm fed up. There's a journalist outside my house. He's, as I said, he's part porcine, part piglet. And yeah. so you offered him to come inside and eat the soup with you. I just felt so excited. Don't you ever some like, like when you're being hassled, like don't you like? I sort of feel that there's that everyone's conducting themselves on this level of oh, you know, I, it's allowed that I'm a journalist and I'm outside this yeah. guy's house and I can hassle harassing him. him. And then just then I just had this realization. Oh my god, I've got a bag of soup in my hand. I'm holding a bag of soup and. I just felt so suddenly, and in fact, I didn't really, like, and I went into the house, Nick, who, uh, uh, my manager, who I was with, goes, come on, mate, pulled me inside. And then I remembered, oh my God, I'm holding this bag of soup. So I shot out there, <laughs> I was so keen. And he looked down, and I opened the bag of soup up, like, like at him, as it's sort of like a, like a vaginal burst of bash, soup slopped right up him. It went sort of up his shoulder, up his tie, up his head. It wasn't hot or anything, it's just no. cold soup. But he went, and then he went, oh my God, what is that? Curry? I don't even <laughs> want to know what it is. Oh, wow. He was so, I felt so excited and pleased. How I mean, close were you to him? Because it like he could have struck you back. I was well within striking range. If he'd oh. had a bag of soup of his own. It, what it, is that, Curry? Right, get me tomato and basil. Yeah, try this. Bring ratatouille. The... <laughs> like, you know, but the problem is, I suppose, I wish I was able to do it in a more light hide mood because I did it in a kind of vengeful mood. Oh, I don't think anyone would see that from a distance and think... That was violent and aggressive, the way he threw that butternut soup. <laughs> you think that any violent act that involves butternut soup is undermined yeah, what is by butternut the butternut soup? Isn't it butternut squash? Button... Butternut squash soup. <laughs> <laughs> squash. Butternut soup. <laughs> Mr. G's here with us, helping us to name soups correctly, and also he'll be summarising the show like he did in the, in the good old days. You'll be able so what... to email us eventually on this show and contribute by emailing Russell and Matt or Audio Boom. What happened at the end of that soup thing? Just... Sort of, you know, Sorry. like after you've been in a confrontation of any kind, you feel sort of that bristly sense of I don't like that adrenaline that takes ages to go away. And I always feel bad as well on a sort of a level of, oh, I shouldn't have thrown soup at that man. But I also feel quite happy that he had soup on him. Like that he you, had to go home sort of, surprised by his own soupy... It's the sort of thing that you could sort of have him in and give him a shower and then, do you know what I mean? Like you'd do something like that and then sort of think, oh, sorry, mate, do you want to come in for a shower? And then he'd agree. annoy you again. That's yeah, <laughs> with a baguette. Roast tomato. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so they, they, why didn't they run with that? Because that's a story. It's a great story. I don't know why they didn't use... They could have had a picture of him covered in soup with a sad face. Sort of going, look, my life's ruined. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, they missed a the trick there. They missed a the trick, didn't they? They missed the potential article. So it's sort of like... That's an example, I suppose, of how I've not changed. That's kind you, of Did you see that as the universe has had you carrying a bag of soup or something I did. Good. so you saw it as a karmic thing and then you threw that on him it's full circle I thought it was the circle of life 
I thought I was being cosmically guided. I thought, why am I holding this bag of soup if it's yeah. not ju- what if you'd just have found to throw a it? sword at the end of the road? I would have plunged Look Excalibur <laughs> into his portly pig belly. No, I think that's a. That, I don't think it's the worst assault. I no. think it's all right. No, the worst things have happened, don't they? I like the fact that he re- re- reacted mainly to the flavour of the soup. What is this? Carry on. No, no, I don't like this. That's off. How did you make this? Yeah, so that's how I've been spending my time. You've changed, I suppose, in that you're a father figure. Yeah, I mean, well, you're just I'm actually a father. Earlier on, when I was trying to capture what had happened to me, I goes, you live with that son now. Now you live with that son. You live with that son guy. What's his name? <laughs> Sally boy. Cohen. That's him. Yeah, no, I'm a father now. I never thought that, you know, that would happen. It was inevitable. Well, medically the way and also on. socially. Yeah. And romantically and but everything. But now I've seen you with him and I can verify you are a father. I'm a dad. What's going on on the practical level? Well, he's two and a half now, so we got through the whole baby stage. Is that you know? better now that he's not a baby? I think it gets easier as they get older. Babies are sort of little alien things, and then but now they can you can talk to them, reason with them. Have you ever found yourself doing something you think this is not what a father should be doing? That was irresponsible, and that he should be taken into care. Um, well, like if you left him somewhere or anything <laughs> no, like that, no, you put him in a box to, to keep him under control. No, I did th- play a game with him where he liked, which I was throwing cushions at him. Yeah. from quite far away and he gets harder more like that okay. and it got to the point where they were like hitting him and knocking him right over and he making still him, liked it he liked it and then I he sort of thought too far. out of context this looks like I'm just bombarding Holy. him violently with cushions but no he's no. to an onlooker from a, like perhaps a neighbour spying at you in yeah your oh it tents. would look like yeah apart from the giggling it would look brutal Morgan's at it again missiles across the room <laughs> at his boy oh it's harrowing no, he wasn't. No, but it's good. You should get involved. Well, I not want, with him. I mean, with your own one. I'd rate. I, I'm thinking about. I would. I want one. I'm wondering whether. To, I mean, could I adopt? To be honest, I would think I'd just end up palming him off. I think I'd adopt Sorry? him. <laughs> I think as soon as he got home, I'd go. I don't want nothing to do with you. Yeah, it's, you, yeah. It's, <laughs> no. I think I would be able to take the responsibility. I think minute I got him back from, I like to think. Africa, Malaysia. Oh, right. Well, that's a bit fun. fashionable, though, isn't it? Shouldn't you get one get from... Get a little white lad. Yeah. Come on, he's Sally Boy! It's <laughs> Well, it's very hard to adopt. You, but like, that's the irony. You could just go and have one with anyone. You can have one. But to actually get one that's anyone. already in existence without making your own is very difficult. One that's already surplus to requirements down the orphanage. Yeah, especially now that you've admitted you'd get bored of him when you got him up. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to look good. Mr. Brand, we refer you to this recording. I'd get bar- bored of him when I get home and palm him off. <laughs> that don't look good. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. I suppose it's becoming evident that, uh, that there's a... a a child shaped hole in my life because I keep doing <laughs> things to like like for example I wrote that children's book Pied Piper the other week I was reading it at the Royal Festival Hall uh, with the illustrator Chris Riddell done the brilliant illustrations in the book and uh, at the end <laughs> like it was meant to be a questions you know the kids go Russell what's your interest they all ask the same question what made you write a children's book what like children say that that's a very yeah, strange question from children question. you'd think they'd go What's your favourite colour? Or something like that. But they know that the context they're in, Matt. What's the inspiration? Not... Why is there so many stars in the sky? Yeah. They know that they're at a reading, that they've got to narrow it down. I think they've been coached. Well, of course they must have done. Because kids would just ask mad questions. They wouldn't sort of go, What made you choose the Pied Piper of Hamlin? Do you think the Pied Piper is emblematic of man's <laughs> identity beyond duality, Mr. Brad? What is it about? It is mental, isn't it? The funny it? thing about a fairy story like the Pied Piper or any fairy story, or perhaps even good art and religion in general, is it refers to something that can't quite be explained. Because the, if you break down the Pied Piper, there's a town, the town gets rats, the Pied Piper turns up. It's a bit like Jaws, actually. The, the guy turns up and says, I can deal with this problem. They knock him. He says, look pay me for that they say no he takes all the children that is at best an, an overreaction but like somehow when you read it it Hang on. kind that, of makes sense if you're equating that to Jaws that's the equivalent of the bloke with the boat yeah. them saying pay him and then him not doing it and then yeah. going around biting people on the beach <laughs> 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 which would be a very different movie I right like- and I'll bite people on the beach <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I got a little shark. Chop that on the leg. God, you're going to leave another big, a big boat. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but I suppose there is an element of that. He's it's a mysterious a stranger. He turns up and deals with... I mean, because well, what I think fairy stories are about, aren't they, is that the whole town is a metaphor for the consciousness of an individual. The town is you as an individual. Mm. The pipe, the rats is your animal nature, your ugliness. To get rid of that, you have to access this figure, this aspect of you that's beyond duality. And if you don't deal with that honestly and truthfully, you'll lose your innocence or the children. Because like, yeah. I thought like, it evokes a feeling in fairy stories. Stories. You don't sort of, you sort of, it makes you feel sort of weird. That's, I think, the point of them. It's but the is that because we something. remember them from childhood, or do you think they are sort of Jungian like? It's Jungian. It's Jungian. I mean, some of them are a bit more literal, aren't they? Like Red Riding Hood is like a woman on the verge of sexual maturity. He's got to stay on the path to reach grandmother's house to become the matriarch. Don't go off with that wolf, the wolf of your own lupine sexuality. Red Riding Hood, you stay on the path, get to grandma's house. A bit more obvious. I thought it was just to teach kids, not you know, danger. Teach kids danger? Yeah. What, like, well, the wolf's green a, cross code? The wolf's obviously like a, well, you know. He's up to no good. Yeah. Well, I think that they, I think that they have more potent messages. That's how they endure because they yeah. are not. They relate to stuff that you can only understand through stories that you can't understand in a simple way. I mean, so I tried to tell that to the kids at the Royal Festival. Or many of them just openly <laughs> wept. <laughs> uh, uh, at the end of it, I goes, I let chaos reign. Yeah, I goes right. Any children that want to come up here, come up here. And before you know, it was well, not ironic. It was Jermaine. It was the Pied Piper. I was surrounded by children. Although I did see someone on Twitter say they like, looked to like uh, all that was required was for Jarvis Cocker to come over and get his bum out because <laughs> really? I was like, surrounded by just like Michael like Jackson. Kids. Yeah. Did any children choose not to go up there? If you say that to it, does any children want to come up on stage? You'd have to be. They a came bit. in their droves. All of them. Like a, a load of them. It was an amazing feeling to get mobbed by children. It's yeah. not like a normal feeling because they're obviously they're little. One of them. I think there's a tipping point with kids where they just weep and weep. There's a tipping point with children where, like, around before six, they, 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 it's like they've got access to this world of total magic. Like, one of the inquiries, there's like one of them was just staring at me, telling me about his dreams and things like that in a crowd, yeah. oblivious to the fact there's a crowd. When about eight or nine, they are just, I, I feel like they're more like miniature adults. They're dealing with you, they're reasoning with you. Yeah, they've learned to suppress certain parts of their personality. They're like giddy little artists, like the maybe on their seventh birthday they just think, "Well, come on, time to grow up a bit here. Yeah. Can't go on forever just blabbing about everything I feel." You got a cold, did he, your boy? Yeah, and then you got one too. That's the hard thing. If you have a kid, the worst thing is when they're ill. It's really hard because even though he like, it's not serious, but they have when they have a cold, they get a temperature, and they feel boiling hot, and you have to try and get medicine into them so like they don't he, understand the concept no they don't because kids medicine is pretty sweet and sugary and normally they quite like it right but he got into his head he didn't like medicine because we had to give him this other stuff once like cough medicine tasted horrible and so what you have to do is get a syringe like a plastic syringe no needle obviously put the kids medicine into it and then hold them down right, put your finger between their teeth so they can't bite their mouth shut and shoot it against their cheek and then they go <laughs> And that's swallow awful. it. It's awful. That's awful. They're that's screaming. like Guantanamo Bay. That's yeah, like waterboarding. Yeah, force feeding them. You are. And then you take them to the hospital and they just, that's how they say you do it. When we were in America once, they gave us a thing, what do you call it? A thing that goes up your bum. Suppository. Still go. That's it. <laughs> I pray to God it's a suppository <laughs> for this Sorry, context. Sorry, yes, it's not a butt plug. <laughs> they gave us a tiny little, well, they didn't, they put it, they used it, right? They, we said, oh, he won't take medicine. And I'm like, okay, we get a suppository, right? up his bum. Back in England. That's worse. Like no, if you it's won't so take tiny. medicine, it's so it's tiny. It's something up your bum. Like, yeah. Well, is it like a threat? Well, they don't, I don't think they. Listen, it's so tiny. Like here, it would be. Yeah, obviously, it'd be worse, wouldn't it? As an adult, like if you don't eat this, it's going up your bum, right? <laughs> but, you will eat your carrots. <laughs> or they're going up sideways. <laughs> but when I was back in the UK, this GP, we said, "Are oh, we really struggling to get medicine into him?" And I said. I forgot the word for suppository, as I just did. Why do you keep forgetting the word for suppository? Because I'm not very good with words. When it's always been a key part of your life. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so I said to the GP, um, could we put it up his bum? Right, meaning <laughs> like the medicine, like not, I felt like the drug, right? Right, not the word suppository medicine. was in that context vital. 
Like, there's no it way was. of getting through that conversation without the word suppository. Yeah. Because when you... I mean, what happened after you've well, gone... Well, the whole... It, it was as if the walls of the surgery collapsed. Yeah. My wife looked at me in horror. Everything went wrong. Because I said... She goes, oh, if he's not taking it... She was an Indian lady. She was like, oh, if he's not taking a medicine, then you must... And I said, could we put it up his bum? Like mm. that. And then she went... She just sort of put a pen down. You know the way doctors yeah, do. When they put the pen down, that's bad for you. Yeah. And she probably pressed the button under the desk. You was immediately put on a Things register. Were, I, I reckon I was. And then she turned around to me. She just went, um, no, we don't want to be putting things up our baby's bottoms. <laughs> like <laughs> you shouldn't have to be told that. What See, like, say it happened in America? At the beginning of this interview, Mr. Morgan, I said to you, have you done oh, anything don't. with your child that's unusual or implies within it that you are an unfit father. Or within a... minutes, what we've admitted is you can try to medicine him up the jacksy in front of a doctor. No, but like I, that's I'm being that was just so semantics. committed to his... Yeah, it's it just semantics. semantics. Yeah. If you'd said the word, what about a suppository? I don't think she'd have gone... I think she'd have still put... <laughs> I think she'd have, <laughs> she'd have still put her pen what, down. What shit comes out? <laughs> She's a bit childish, actually. I'm on your side now. I've, yeah. got, I've gone on an about farch. I, I think it's called. I an used, about farch. Germans. I, listen, I euphemised it and said... That's not put a euphemism up, up the bum, mate. That's I plain didn't English. Say, like, can we boot it up his ass? Did I? I said... Yeah, what about... Out the Aries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, it was just bad. But... um. Mm. Yeah, that, How I've did had, you I've end had it? that from GPs quite a bit when it because I'm a hypochondriac and now I've projected it's down good to that you've COVID. admitted it. Well, I've always admitted it. You used to it. deny it. You never That's used a real to say condition, I'm a, even, so of course I'll admit it. I recently received a letter from your mother in which she reiterated your hypochondria. Thank you, Russell. She said for your endless generosity. I won't go into details. <laughs> <laughs> That's Slightly not what the story is about. The story's not about my generosity. That's a side note. She said. Then she goes, uh, we've all been a bit ill over Christmas, except for Matt, the hypochondriac. Yeah, well, there you go. It protect- you. Being a hypochondriac actually protects you because you're so much more worried about picking up germs or, you know, like if someone sneezes on a train, I'll move now. I don't care. Like, because mm. I just think, oh, don't- if I get a cold, my little boy gets a cold. you think there's a bomb in a bag? I do think that sometimes. Mm. I sit there and just think, nah. What about this? So, okay, so he got a cold, you got a cold. What happened next? Well, what happened, Well, the only... I suppose there was something more embarrassing that happened, right? So he, he's really snotty, and he, you have to teach them how to blow their nose. You know, you just think that's obvious. Mm. And so you go, blow, and he knows blowing in the context of birthday candles. So he Bloody goes... birthday <gasps> candles. Like that. <laughs> and you go, no, blow through your nose. And he's like, looks at you like you're mad. And then you go... <gasps> And you teach him it. Police siren there, likely coming to claim that. Yeah, here they go, yes. <laughs> My big suitcase full of suppositories for <laughs> the local children. Um, so you have to teach him the concept he, of blow the old Utah. Yes, you have to, you have to, you know, you're teaching him about life. How? You, if you've got, he was asleep on me, right? This is the story, or, yeah. you know, whatever. I put, let's me, get there. I put my hands up, right? Let's, let's have it. He was asleep on my stomach, I was wearing a black t-shirt. Lovely so far, an image of, it could be an Athena poster. That right. could be an Athena poster. It could be, Matt Morgan, it should be. laying down, he's got his son asleep on his chest lovely what you've a got great that image. son you live with right? he's, he's got asleep. that little fella a version of him made out of all these bits of bobs and jeans and cuddly by down of his missus now he lives with a guy right, love so it. it childhood I call we've it we've set the scene he's asleep on my chest and he's got snot he's wiped his nose on my black t-shirt I'm covered in snot he's been going on for ages but as a father you just think that's part fine. of life I'd rather now. that stuff's not in his nose than it, you know it's you've so let what, go it's of on my kind t-shirt. of vanity don't care Totally given up. Look what I'm wearing on my feet. Boots. Obnail boots. Obnail boots. It looks like someone's wandered straight in from the street, digging up a road into here to do a podcast, stopping yeah. only to jam an unwanted suppository into a stranger's bottom who's probably a child. But anyway, so I'm covered in like snot, children's mm. snot. And then uh, I got a delivery and the Amazon man opened the door. And I sort of looked, I took the package and signed for it. And then I noticed oh, I've got snot all over my T-shirt. And then... Obviously, mm. you realise what it actually looks like. Gubbins. Sp- yeah. What's his name? Chisholm. Man muck. Spunk. Cock porridge. Uh, baby gravy. <laughs> <That's> butter. <laughs> um, no. Tummy worms. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. So what is that, that delivery man, he sees you. A man who minutes ago was the star of an Athena poster yeah. with a lovely child. I put my child down gently. I ran to the door. 
mm. nimble footed as not to wake him. <laughs> Opened the door and then sort of saw it at the same time oh, as God. him. And I, well, I thought, I'm not going to go into what it is. I just mm. said, that's not what you think it is. What did he say? He just looked at it like it was. <laughs> I think the mistake you made is like trying to imply that you understand what's going on in a stranger's mind. Why? I'm always trying to close down that gap between me and what's going on in the mind of others. But you've got to be, you've got to know what's going on in the mind of others. You've got to know for sure that that man's I knew that. what was going on in his mind. because he, look he down looked down? down. Yeah. No, maybe, I don't know. But I, I felt that he was looking at it judgmentally going, oh, you know, took the day off work to masturbate, have you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> While you're waiting in for your deliveries. It's a shame, really. It's it a looks shame, very really. similar. Like once it's, it's the basic same produce. I mean, I heard someone say once that there's, it's the basic same ingredients. I mean, Who other said than... that? It's just you one. when you get tr- trying to get someone to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> what? It's, it's not, I mean. <laughs> it's Come only on. the same as spunk. Come on, mum. <laughs> <laughs> Who was you saying? I said mum. Mum. I regret it. it. What? It was you. Unbroadcastable. No, unbroadcastable. that's not unbroadcastable. <laughs> So, so anyway, yeah, I'm a parent and I'm failing quite badly at it. Are we ever truly adults? You're listening to Russell and Matt's podcast. Teenage boy poses as a doctor in hospital gynecology department for a month. Now, already, I identify, when I was a teenage boy, I wanted nothing more than to glean knowledge of that aspect of femininity. But the fact that the boy could pull it off for one month. You wanted nothing more than to be a medically qualified gynecologist. That's all he wanted. No, that you. Is... You just said that's what you I wanted. I was a boy with a dream. I was like a real life Doogie Hauser. You didn't want to, you're not that. You just wanted to see pictures of it, didn't you? You didn't want to actually go and have to do the day to day grind. Of course, I thought the daily grind of diseased vaginas. <laughs> all I want is the daily grind of diseased vaginas and I'll be a happy man. Would you like to see a healthy one? Not interested, nope. sir. Not interested. Come back when you're poorly, love. A teenage boy posed as a doctor in a hospital gynaecology department for over a month before staff realised he's not a physician. I don't think you should be able to get away with that in a sandwich shop or, or no, anywhere. No, but like if I, when I was 17, if I did anything for a month, even if it was something good... What, like, like? I don't know, like helping old people get their shopping. You wouldn't do that. You I wouldn't. wouldn't. Help. Why don't we encourage people to help one another? Well, I'd help them get their shopping and then look at their genitals. A vehicle? Hmm? What? No, I didn't say anything. We, we couldn't help others. I heard genitals. We could, we could be using this podcast to say, why don't you do one good deed a day? I'll do a good deed a day. You do a good deed a day. If I change, you change. Maybe the old damn will change. I think you should do more than, like, because that's too easy. Go what, to do a good deed? And then give, people could tell us what good deed they've done. What's wrong with that? Yeah, all right. But tell then us that, about a good deed. Not boring ones. I bought a homeless man a cup of tea. Boring. That's boring. Boring, boring kindness, boring, boring kindness. Yeah, I think people should do a day. You can volunteer all for a day. day. Yeah. I don't want to hear the out accounts, what people right, have do been doing all day long. Go. Can't I just do one unusual act of kindness a day? Get a, like, But it has to be more, they can't just be in the moment. You've got, got to go to someone's house, like an old person, and go, do you need any shopping? And then go and do their shopping. I think there's got to be imagination in it. I'm not interested in getting an old person's sh- I'm Great that you've done it, but can you be more creative? Say so I went around to an old person's house, I trimmed their toenails, I painted them violet. Against their will. The man was in the coma. His family is suing me. I like. There's got to be like. A, there's got to be a novel aspect to it. Is what I will say, man. All right. People have to do good things and tell us about them with proof. Interesting proof. things. Proof. Don't just say you've done something good. We can all say. Well, it. we have to do it as well. Have you done anything? What have you done today I'm always to doing make stuff? This is the new item. What have you done today to make you feel proud? Sponsored by. And people, was it that sang that? I don't know, but yeah. Anyway, what have you done today to make you feel proud, Matt? Me? Anything? Nothing. No, nothing. We Hang human on, let beings me think. in infinite space, we're going to die one day, and you've done nothing today to no, make I've you feel proud. No, I've done nothing today, but a lot of, like, a few times in my life, people in something. wheelchairs have come up to me and gone, Can you give me a push? <laughs> I swear, I swear <laughs> to God. Happened? It's never happened a to few anyone times else. times in your life. It's very Give rare. Us a breakdown in my of life, one of the three occasions. or four times, right? Once I was Give walking into push. Camden, and there was a man. And we were in uh, Kentish Town, and mm-hmm. he and he was crossing the road, and he was pushing himself, and he went, "Excuse me, mate, couldn't give me a push," and I gave him a push. And once when I was a teenage boy going to school or coming yeah. home from school, yeah. it happened in Dartford and the, I pushed him for miles. Go, really? And he made lots of jokes like, oh, going out dancing tonight. Oh, you know, like stuff about it. And I was, Did you go along with the jokes? Yeah, but you're pushing them so they can't see your face. So you have to go, ha <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, to really lean into that laugh. Yeah. 
You have to really sell Didn't that. Sound sarcastic. And then, and you don't want to sound like you're laughing. The laughter. Good one, of... pal. Good one. Good one. Chin up, son. Here we go. Where did you? <laughs> I'm happy to push you without out the out cracks, you know. Tip you out at the bus stop. <laughs> I'll go with another one. Life. Yeah, that no. is unusual that you're looked upon, but it's in, you've got to ransack your own adolescence to find even a mildly altruistic act, and that was forced upon you. It weren't voluntary, was it? I suppose, it? yeah. But so let's see. Yeah, what have you done today to make you feel proud? What have you done then? All right, hold on. I must have done something. I doubt it. <laughs> <sighs> oh, I sent a really good email earlier. I really yeah. gave a what Two for. Two kisses. <laughs> 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 let's talk about this bloke. Doogie Teenage Houser, boy. Dirty yeah. Doogie Houser, Dirty the Doogie. little snatch inspector. <laughs> <laughs> this 17-year-old lad, he wore a white coat bearing the St. Mary Medical Centre in West Palm Beach as he walked to the corridors. Ugh. His deception was only spotted when he presented himself with a patient to Dr. Sebastian <laughs> Kent, who worked in the obstetrics and gynaecology department. Uh, Dr. Kent, I've got another patient here. Look at her wasp name. It's all covered in snitchaboo. <laughs> but he's only 17. He's like, I don't know what's wrong with her, but there's hair growing all over it. <laughs> I mean, I was terrified. It's like a bunch of spiders <laughs> lives out the front of her patch. I saw mummies once going into the shower, and that's what made me come this doctor. I found a lady here. She hasn't got a willy or balls at all. It's just a terrible wound. <laughs> Take a look, Sebastian Kent. I've tried to close it up with rubber bands, but all she does <laughs> is piss and moan. <laughs> I, I gave her a cut. <coughs> Doogie Hauser is a real life Doogie Hauser. Well, it's not because Doogie Hauser was a fully qualified doctor. He's not a real life Doogie Hauser. He's a real and life Doogie fantasist. Doogie Hauser went on to do the Oscars. That he is did. Doogie Hauser. He did. But this, so, this guy's you're saying going this guy's nowhere. not a real life Doogie Howser because I was about to start a new item. Real life Doogie Howser. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be Doogie Howser, Matt. Imagine a real life Dill Boy or a real life Septo and Son or a real life, not Bill Cosby, but something else that's <laughs> not so contentious. Real life things. Okay, real life versions of stuff. Wurzel Gummidge. Imagine a real life Wurzel Gummidge. I a don't man... have to imagine. He's uh, in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> Scarecrow creature that one minute's got his crazy head on and the very next minute is after a fella and it's time to get over a waffle man. <laughs> That's quite a good impression. It was pretty good that, wasn't it? Hang yeah, on. I done one of Martin Luther King the other day. It was top notch. You I did don't... an impression of Martin Luther King? I mean, all the other Chelsea fans liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, I don't even know how he talks. There's only that one I phone. will calm down That's Elvis. the mountain. That's Elvis Presley. <laughs> I will leave. Oh, hold on a minute. You ain't oh, nothing. Thank you very much. But a hot <laughs> dog. That's yeah. a good Martin Luther King. Is this wrong? I well, got... hold on a sec. G's black. You don't look pleased. <laughs> he's yeah, going he's, in the poem. He's not actually he's said anything, the... just hissed. Can't do he's, he's just hissed at us. He'll answer us through poetry. If I can have a dream. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh. I did one in an episode of The Truths. And I just got because I was watching that film about Martin Luther King the other day, and I thought I could have done that better than that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I could have done that better. Really? I thought I could, because well, I don't know. I mean, there's some you areas where you would have had to wear black makeup, and that would have been very racist. So <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, I've but, been hired for my voice, guys. Really? Guys, just this. look at it. Look at we're not prepared to look. Black me up. I'm <laughs> ready. <laughs> now, in the name of Martin Luther King, <laughs> black me up. <laughs> like it's 1965. I have a dream where white men can take roles from black men. <laughs> this abundance of roles for black actors has gone on for too long. How about me, a white man? It's racist. Let only black people play black people. <laughs> Surely you saw my Malcolm X <laughs> at the National Theatre. Hey, listen. What about real life Doogie Howser? Yeah, if you've met the, a real get life to the something, of this. send us that real life thing. And what have you done today to make you feel proud? Dr. Kent. Dr. Sebastian Kent. He's what? I, I've gone off Dr. Sebastian Kent. Well, listen to what he says here. Go on. The first thing I thought was, and then he repeats himself, so I'm. It's a bit weird. I am getting, I am really getting old because these young do doc daughters, these young doctors look younger every year, Dr. Kent said. It's weird that he's approached it as if he's sort of doing like a sort of, a, I don't know, it feels like a sort of a, like an R&B song. I am getting, I'm really getting, <laughs> I'm getting so old. Like, it, why, why, why is he sort he of... He built up. They could have lost that whole I gospel. am getting. 
Yeah, I'm but, getting, I'm really getting old because these doctors look younger every year and their knowledge of medicine and vaginas yeah, is that's deteriorating what you think. by the moment. Like, you would, like this the lad didn't even know the proper word for one. <laughs> <laughs> Calling it uh, I'm an old mother Hubbard <laughs> and then uh, giggling and sprinting out of the room. Yeah, like all you go is, this guy looks young when he's going, <laughs> look at that. What's <laughs> 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 that little button do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> Oh dear. Staff later contacted security who alerted the police. The hospital said the hospital immediately notified local authorities who took yeah, the individual. Staff later contacted security. Oh, that's a bit weird. We better. Well, Dr. Kent just let it go. Dr. Kent just thought he's just young. He looks young. Walked Mind off. you, we all remember Doogie Howser. Perhaps I'm in Doogie Howser now. <laughs> Perhaps reality is just this construction and I'm actually in a sitcom. Oh, well, it must be that then. Brilliant. I'm just going to go home, talk to my wife, Claire Huxtable. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I'll be doing for the evening because I'm not a Cliff Huxtable who was also a doctor as it turns yeah. out <laughs> so you can't be too careful the hospital said oh right the teenager's mother told police her son had not been taking prescribed medication according to WSB TV no charges were filed against right so the lad's not well he's mentally unwell could be a lot it could be an excuse couldn't ridiculing. it right what would you say well what, how specific is his medication he's taking anti-gynecology drugs if as you, we speak if he doesn't get his medicine he will <laughs> assume the identity of a gynecologist <laughs> for a month oh god has he not took his medicine hello mother and is everything uh, normal downstairs have you taken your pills have you taken your pills <laughs> come on let's have a look put your legs up in the stirrups we've taken these stirrups away from you a few times now come on yes and I've spoken to the British Medical Association about that because you had no business doing it did you I'd love, oh, now imagine he is completely gown. mad and he believes that he is one and then he's just like oh, they just won't let me practice every time I start up and I get a few new customers or whatever they're called Patients. I didn't spend seven years at medical school to be spoken <laughs> yeah. to like that, mother. Now, let's was, have a look. Mm? Uh, when you read these so stories... So I lived in there, did I? And then out I came to be one of the finest gynecologists <laughs> known to man. <laughs> Take your bloody medicine, do what is, what is the truth behind this? We the need truth to find behind out. it is... I mean, what the, look, if there is an issue here at stake, it's how can anyone pretend to be anything for a month? For a month. Because if you're like... He, if he just walked around the corridors... I'm struggling to be me. I know. And I am me. Yeah. Like, I, I struggle think, to do jobs I'm trained in. But jobs like, I've trained in, roles in life. I sort of sometimes think I might just become a totally different person. Reggie Perrin style. It's a sitcom from the 80s in which a man gave up his life. But, I sometimes think I might just start a new life. Apparently, I've heard this... Anyone doing any job, you know, when you read writers telling you how to write, and they go, well, I just think I'm getting away with this. Everyone, Everyone says, says that, that, even policemen. But I always think this, when you're a policeman... Sometimes I think when I'm conducting some institutionalised races, I'm getting away with this. <laughs> Whoa, you are, and it's got to stop. No, but like when policemen walk down the road, sometimes they must think, oh yeah, I'm a policeman. I had this Ooh. amazing moment with some policemen. They pulled over in one of those red police cars. That means they're armed. They come over and they goes. Oi, Russell! And I went, ah, oh, right there. And I'm always very nice to the police, always very Sign nice. Sign the gun! <laughs> he, well, they pulled over, and like, in the back of their car, they had like a big cupboard of guns. And they went, oi, come and have a look at this. And I went, pull back a thing. Just loads of guns. I went, have a look at that. And I was like, bloody hell, chap, that's amazing. Well done. <laughs> On your way, then, go see that, mate. <laughs> that's terrifying. They just showed me a big load of guns, like as if like they couldn't believe it. <laughs> like it was an ice cream van, and the ice cream man couldn't believe he had well, access they went, to all his Russell, Look at this. Look at that. And they was like, and they were like oh no! Like, like they were still amazed like by hand themselves. Hand guns or like rifles, guns. There was about seven different firearms in the back of that. Oh yeah, that'd blow your bloody head off, wouldn't it? Hey? Were like, they oh. threatening you? Oh, maybe they were like, yeah. That's right, revolution there, there son. Look at that. <laughs> it seemed very like they were, honestly. It was say it's someone has got a bag of conkers. Now, that's when... I've, see what I mean? That's what? old. That's an old person thing. Yeah. Who talks about conkers now? Well, I don't know. Do Dude, children they, are they into don't that? care about conkers. They, they don't really... care about conkers. They all go to colleges, man. <laughs> Give me a collection of conkers. They're looking up people's vaginas. <laughs> mm. um, that's terrifying. The police are going, oh, mate, look at this. Oh, look at this. Look at this. What have we got? I'll blow you to kingdom come that will I'll keep walking yeah, what did you go like I've got a bag days. of soup I've got a bag of soup butternut oh. soup I'll butternut you officer <laughs> you step away from me with your gun covered and you'll get butternutted <laughs> I'll butternut you so hard I will yeah 
So there you are, Matthew. It's a dangerous world we're living in. You're listening to the Russell Brand podcast with me and Matt Morgan. Mr. G will summarise the show. Do you feel that we should involve Noel at some point? You're worried that yeah, he's we should phone not him. been included. He he's don't, he's find invo- out. He is wanting to be involved. How do you know? Was he reached out to you? I spoke What's to him the other day. What's happening with that fucking podcast? Yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. Oh, fucking come on, let us know. When am I going to expect in the fucking car? What's going on? Yeah, maybe he said he'll do whatever he want, we want. He'll sit on my knee like a ventriloquist dummy. Did he, he said. say that? Yeah. I'll sit on your knee like a ventriloquist dummy if you want. Yeah. Well, that's undignified. I know. It might, it might be funny for a few minutes, then I'd... It would ruin the rapport between the two of us, which is why he ain't here now. <laughs> <laughs> but I did say to him, look, Just let's, look, let's find our feet, mate. Let's we didn't turn up when you used a... to be. Remember you was in that pub band? We didn't used to turn up, <laughs> did we? And stuff. Like, I can help him up around the maracas. Go on, give us a go. Give us a go on your heart. Look, there's a, let's face it. There's a few things we could talk about. You wanted to talk about life on Mars. There's an expedition being planned to set up a colony on Mars. Man wants to conquer the galaxy. I myself have been offered a trip to space when I was a married man. Yeah. What I didn't go. That? One of the first spaceship blew up. He, didn't I don't, it? No one's gone yet, have they? I'm not going to space. Have you seen the... the people on the first trip? They were white knobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not the reason not to go. It is. You better it's... look out the window, not at them. <laughs> Behold the mysteries of the galaxy. What's Richard Brent's with the pick in his hooter? Oh, Prince Harry, this coffee, he's got a stiffy. I ate it in space. Dear Mark, bring me back home. That's how we get it on. Um, oh, I ate it up here. So hang on, what is the ticket? You, so your ex, what can we say her name? Wife. Your ex-wife. Why not? Katie Perry. Why are you saying the name for? I thought I just said, can I say the name? Wife. Oh, That's wife. That's I said. I went oh, right. wife. You thought I said Wi-Fi. I, I don't know what you were saying. Way through. Your ex-wife, Katy Perry, <laughs> <laughs> bought you a ticket to, to space. space. Well, I mean, that's not that's a red flag for me anyway. What, in marriage, she's like saying, "F yeah, off into it's only a forty percent chance of living through this." I'll send him. And look at this for Easter. <laughs> and swim in a shark infested pool. And what's this? Visit Charles Manson. And what's this? A pile of heroin. You're so affectionate. This is going very, very, very well. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's. So what do you get? A ticket? You have, actually have a ticket? Or is she just saying, "Oh, I will buy you one eventually"? So have you got a ticket to space? I don't know where it is, but I think it was pretty steep. I mean, it was a, you know, like I often give people a certificate. But so a, she's paid. I gave for you it. one for a tattoo. Did you get the tattoo? No. You can see. No one I couldn't ever goes get a and day gets off it from my kid. You could have took him no, in me, your spunk it... covered rags <laughs> <laughs> and got yourself inked up in Camden. You can't get tattoos when you've got a toddler. You get a tattoo? All right, I will. Where I need did to I get, get you some more. I bet you can't even remember the infrastructure. I can't remember, but the, you bought me a. You didn't buy me. You made me a token beautifully mm-hmm. for a tattoo for me and my wife but then we couldn't get a babysitter to go and have it and then we no never got round to it no one my gifts I get everyone to learn to meditate no one does it you don't do it do you I Gareth doesn't do it. it G do you do it none of you no, I'm the only person who's spiritually connected you're the only person with time on his hands I wish I was meditating right now because what you just said then was so hurtful <laughs> that's why I don't stay in this dimension that's true you are very busy man. I'm very busy why only this weekend I was <laughs> With Gaza or reading the Pied Piper, I lead a very, very busy life. What were you doing with Gaza? Con- like he was so beautiful and fragile. So this is what I think. I think that genius surges through fragile structures, and that powerful psychological structures prevent the flow of that sublime force. So I think there is a fragility to a lot of artists, whether or even people that have extreme abilities in any arena, because it's like there's a powerful flow that prevents. Uh, like structures psychological structures holding on you know I don't know the chicken and egg of it all yeah, yeah. but there was a, like a, there's a corollary of fragility in sort of extremely gifted people and I include myself in that well that, that is weird that... Say, I'm in the top 50 brain boxes in a magazine you won't have heard of that's how clever I might be so in the case of Gaza because I was going to say like caught up on that <laughs> I'm so smart <laughs> going, yeah, in the case of Gaza, yeah, so Gaza like obviously that's mm. football skill right yeah so you think that that's a, a heavy s- burden 
I think the way some people play football, like like him, there's a sort of a sublime component. If you think of the speed, the rate at which he's making decisions, it's sort of like it doesn't. It's like wow, bloody hell! How did you work all that out so quickly? Right, it's right. sort of an amazing flow to it. It's not like just sort of blunt, crude athleticism and practice. It's like some raw otherness is coming through him, and that's why I think he connects to people. And it's the same, I think, with genius in in any discipline there's some people you think oh my god that's a really well crafted piece of literature or a wonderful painting or I don't know concerto or whatever and then there's other people who, I think the nature of genius is, is for me you can't work out how it's happened it's but you know what happened? is the difference Go on. all those forms like art music or anything you can do all your life Whereas mm. if you're a genius at something physical, you're relying on your body, right? Mm. So that obviously can't last forever. Then what do you do? You've got all this. So is that what you're his saying? Life, like he's, well, like this, yeah, they, 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 I mean, I think he is legitimately a tragic figure in that his life has outlived his gift. But I did actually say to you on the show, that greatness is still in it. Because I was doing it. I was yeah, commentating be a on manager. a football match for BT Sport. Well, that's the problem. And I, like, is the problem I think is, is like if you were, like the nature of genius is it's hard to convey it. But I think that, you know, it would be a sort of a challenge. For like, so I mean, how is Paul Gascoigne going to find another way of utilising that? And I, and I suppose that's a, I mean, that's a little bit of a quest that he's on there. Mm. How else do other people do it? Like, Fate, Well, I think extremely gifted footballers don't offer, like, you know, like, say, George Best or sort of Pele became this sort of, has become sort of a brand ambassador figure. Maradona's clearly really tra- 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 trouble. Beckham. Johan Cruyff has sort of, like, be, like clearly had a different kind of football in mind. That's sort of like the extreme, like, David Beckham, uh, like, was really, really gifted, but, like, a... Uh, <clears throat> doesn't seem to have been a, I think perhaps he like made good career decisions like he ended up at Manchester United where there's sort of like good structure and support and, and he's stuff. handsome so he could do all that sort of celebrity right. stuff and he's looked after himself very very well hasn't he and made really really sort of smart decisions but anyway look none of this is getting us any closer to understanding life on Mars and that's what you ah, yes. wanted to talk about I had a ticket to ride and I don't care right but, but like the thing you're interested in is a new colonisation well there's this thing Mars. and it's called Mars One and they're looking for a hundred people to colonize mars and with the proviso that they'll die there it's, it's a one-way trip the only people you're going to attract to go and colonize mars before the proper structures are there to live safely on mars is bloody idiots yeah like so should we, should talk we go about it in the next show <laughs> <laughs> Because I wouldn't want to. I mean, the fact is, we're going to die here, aren't we? But it just makes you sort of have to confront the finality of your death possibly on some uninhabitable red desert it's just so t- terrible because in a way it's like you've as soon as you leave the planet you're dead because you're That's never it, coming back you. right so but isn't it the same if you just went say you just went to live in great yarmouth like and then died there and you think and oh, you're I'm not never- cu- and you said i'm just not coming back i'm standing in great yarmouth i mean you're not everywhere else i mean wherever you are you're yeah. not everywhere else it just it makes you confront death in a new way i suppose yeah it? well it's like it's the ultimate form of travelling, isn't it? You can't, A, you can't come back and you're off the planet. Everything that's ever happened is on this planet apart from a few things on the moon. Yeah, just like... You're miles beyond that. You can't go home. It's a bit like... But then when you think, oh, the house you grew up in, right, is in the same place and everything's the same, but it's spinning around the planet and it's flying through space. So the house you grew up in is constantly moving through space. It's not in the same place. Only like in relation to all the other stuff on Earth. So nothing's really where it was before it shows you that our whole understanding of reality is based on consensual constructions of us like going well this is reality this is England yeah. this is the way we talk this is our flag this is our relationship to space that's why I think like fairy stories are interesting because they try to navigate or negotiate at least that relationship we have with the unknown and the unknowable so there's yeah. an element about a story like the Pied Piper you just think what that's weird or sometimes the, the sort of the chill of a story that works well a horror story or like a piece of art that affects you or the, even the genius of Paul Gascoigne is you think where does that come from how is that happening and I think it's because we know that we're only temporarily awake trying to make sense of the world and everything is so fleeting and it's quite and the stories we tell ourselves are sort of arbitrary your house is flying through space the planet is spinning we're all going to die we have to somehow find reason find rationale find a way of making sense of our place within it we're sort of holding on to stories clinging on to reason and that is what the 17 year old boy who'd been masquerading as a gynecologist said in court (laughs) 
Well, young man, you could look at my fanny any day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> I keep mine behind my ball bag, but it's just as good and twice as much fun. <laughs> now, that, to summarise what we call a podcast, because we live in the future now, whatever it might be, let's give the microphone to Mr G, who still, still seems to be still writing scribbling. to me. Seems to be, the show is run very much like Paul Gascoigne's fear. The, uh, G is still writing, but the time has expired. Mr. G now with a poem to try and make some sort of narrative out of the meaninglessness of that podcast. <laughs> Life serves us a healthy number of heartbeats that nourish us on our different paths. A magic soup diluted by teardrops with a butternut squash thrown in for laughs. There's a theory to everything, so let freedom reign wherever it goes. Reality supplies us with selected suppositories and God bless the child who has his own. All aboard the Capricorn One to the fourth rock past the sun. Yet no matter where we try to escape to, we hold the baggage of where we're from. This earth is forever spinning, revolving with a reasoned grace. So yesterday we'll always find tomorrow if it looks within the right place. Woo! Mr. G, what a fantastic poem. It's like he almost seemed to know that we were going to be talking about the nature of the infinite. That's one of the, we've got a limited number of heart, heartbeats. How does he do it? Is he a mystic? Is like, and he did record, the, he made that poem just now, live. There's no technical trickery. We could have, like, G could do that two days later if he wanted to. He's good. He's a damn good poet. He's a damn fine poet, and you can reach him through me. I'd like to represent him. If you want to email this, you can. Uh, Russell, Matt, Matt, see? Elderly. Russell and Matt at audioboom.com. I mean, even though we're sat in comfortable chairs now, we used to be sort of up on perches, didn't we? Look at us now. We're just, yeah. Withering away. Brought to you by Audioboom. Boom.